Hello everyone, I'm Norman Walberger. This is one of a series of videos on the sociology of mathematics, especially pure mathematics. And I want to go back in time, look at number systems through the ages. In our last video we talked about the Egyptian numerical system, and today we're going to talk about the Babylonian numerical system. So the idea is to try to position this discussion of number systems so that it's a little bit easier for you, as a non-mathematician, to appreciate the subtleties and indeed the difficulties in our modern conception of number. You might think that we have a rather uniform, sort of obvious notion of number. There are just numbers and it's sort of obvious and this has all been laid out a long time ago. Well, actually, it's much more complicated than that. And there's a lot of room for, um, for opposite or opposing views, let's say, especially when it comes to real numbers, which are the foundations of modern analysis and much of pure mathematics. So there's uh, very interesting sort of sociological controversies ahead of us. But to start off with, rooting ourselves in the Egyptian and the Babylonian numerical systems, which are in some sense sort of uh, covering two broad, uh, broadly different approaches to uh, number systems, is a great place to start. So if we're talking about Mesopotamia, ancient Mesopotamia, which is like the Middle East, okay, but it's sort of a particular part of the Middle East, so this is supposed to be a map, this is the Arabian Peninsula here, the Mediterranean, uh, see there, Africa's down here, Asia's up there, uh, Europe's up here, and uh, and Egypt would be over here. And we have these two great rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers, uh, emptying into the uh, Persian Gulf. And it was sort of in this area here that we had this remarkable uh, long-standing period of uh, interesting cultures happening from the very early times. So notably, the first sort of great civilization that we could sort of identify are the Sumerians who arrived probably somewhere before 3500 BC to 2000 BC. And, um, and they, that's quite a long period of time. And at, at some point, the Akkadians uh, developed an empire. That was from around 2400 to 2200 BC. And then uh, by the year 1900 to 1600, the, the Babylonians, like Hammurabi, whom you may have heard of, um, were sort of the dominant force. And it was really the, the Babylonian arithmetic that's particularly interesting because by that time the, the development had sort of solidified and there was then a, a pretty clear-cut uh, sort of arithmetic or numerical uh, system uh, going on, which is remarkably different from any other system uh, that's ever been developed. And it was quite long-standing and it was actually very powerful. The, uh, the Babylonian because it was a base 60 arithmetic. But more generally, this period is, is so interesting because we don't have a lot of physical um, remnants of it like we do in Egypt. There are all these, you know, stone pyramids, temples, palaces, tombs, etc. But over here, they didn't have stone, they had clay. So they built out of clay. They're their cities became ruined and are now more or less just heaps of rubble in, in southern Iraq. But, importantly, they wrote on clay tablets. And this is a, a very important part of the story. So, in fact, we know more about aspects of the ancient Mesopotamian world uh, through all these tablets that we have than we do correspondingly uh, in the Egyptian story. In this general area, there were a lot of real firsts. Um, so this is many times called the cradle of civilization. And, uh, you know, arguably this is perhaps, you know, really the, the most important single uh, historical place in terms of the development of the modern world. Arguably, okay, one can make that case. So there's the invention of writing, the wheel, the plow, beer, mathematics, women's rights, agriculture, surveying. Uh, all of these things uh, can be sort of found with their origins in, in this area. Now what's especially interesting for us, because we're interested in numerical systems, is the fact that they had a base 60 arithmetic, which is completely and utterly astounding, because these are primitive peoples, and base 60, as we'll see, is quite challenging. But interestingly, it offers some important advantages, even over our Hindu-Arabic base 10 numerical system. This is a little bit difficult for modern educators to get their heads around because surely we are superior in all things to ancient peoples. 
Yes, well, maybe, but there's, a, there's a, a case to be made that actually their arithmetic is more powerful than ours, fundamentally. And I'm going to try to explain to you uh, why that is. So I'm going to try to give you a summary of some of the interesting aspects of the Babylonian arithmetic today. So let's discuss first the birth of writing, which took place in this region around 3500 BC. And it was used, you know, at least for communication and for archiving. Uh, that is sort of for referring to how much of stuff we have uh, in terms of inventories and so on. And we can trace at least some of this development of early writing to an uh, earlier period where for thousands of years before this they had been using little clay tokens to represent objects. So they had like little clay balls or little clay cones or cylinders you know, so you have some collection of these things, and they would represent different kinds of objects or quantities. So, for example, maybe, you know, one of these things would represent a, a bushel of, of wheat, and another one might represent a barrel of beer, etc., okay? And so you could record how much of something there was in the place by having a lot of these little things, uh, uh, these clay tokens. Then, at some point, they decided to create records of inventories, okay, by enclosing a collection of these things in, in sort of clay pots, which would then be closed. So you'd have this sort of closed clay pot. Inside there would be these objects. And then this would then be some kind of like permanent record of the, maybe there was a, a, a transaction and I, you know, I, I agreed that to owe you this much, okay? And so we both gonna get a copy of, of this, this bulai it's called, and then that will then be a, a record for, for further times of what actually you owe me or I owe you. Now, inside there might be a number of these tokens, but on the outside, they would represent typically what was going on inside the bulai by making little indentations. So all of this is done in clay, okay? And they have these little styluses, so you can just make some imprintations. So here there's a little cone, so maybe we make a little imprint on the outside representing the cone. And there are two balls, so we make two little ball marks. And there's a cylinder, so we make some kind of little cylinder mark. Alright? So we can trace at least perhaps some of the development of writing to these uh, kinds of inscriptions that, that were created on Bulai. So eventually, after, after some time, there was an evolution, and quantities were indicated by symbols on clay tablets as well. So instead of you know, having so many uh, uh, dots representing bushels of wheat or whatever, we could create some symbols representing quantities. And they would also be inscribed in clay tablets. And typically what happens is that they liked to have different units, you know, because quantities can occur in all kinds of sizes, from very small to very large. So you don't want the same unit, you want to have a, a series of units that cover the, uh, the quantity in question at different scales. So typically, uh, powers of 10 were used. Okay, that's very natural. Uh, so, uh, for example, maybe this is some little like wedge-like thing, and maybe 10 of these was, was a ball. But some, somehow they also used sixes. So sixes also prominently occur. So for example, six of these balls might represent a, a bigger wedge. And then maybe ten of these bigger wedges would be represented by this symbol, which would sort of incorporate a wedge and a ball. Okay. So this kind of numerical representation, however, is intimately connected with metrology. That is, the, the various units that were used for various quantities, be it length or area or, or weight. Or, or volume, you know, etc. Right? So each of these kinds of um, measurements would have different units. So for example, uh, the nindan was a standard unit of, of length. Okay? But uh, once you had a certain number of nindan, then you had some, some other units that would be uh, represented by some other symbols. But typically, we can say that we can recognize that they organized a lot of their metrology with multiples of 10 and 6. Not exclusively, but these two numbers figured particularly prominently in their metrology, in their, in their expression of units to record quantities. So by the Babylonian period, about 1900 to 1600, 
the sexagesimal system was firmly in place. And it was codified in a kind of a standard way that was used reasonably uniformly in many of the city-states that, uh, that were you know, occupying that region. Of course, there was a development here, right? So we can trace the ancestry of this system to earlier Akkadian and Sumerian times. So it's not just the Babylonians invented this. They adopted earlier conventions that the Sumerians and Akkadians used. And here's what they did. So they had a symbol for, for ones, which is like a vertical stroke. And everything here is made on some clay tablet with a little stylus, just a, a reed or something. And then so you make some little marks and that's, uh, those represent ones. And then you, you put the stylus sort of in, in, in a different direction and make a little wedge. And such a wedge represented ten. So since we're talking about a base 60 system, the digits themselves are numbers from zero or one to 59, okay? That's a symbol, that's a digit, that's a number from one to 59. There's another one. Oh, actually, in this case, there's another one, there's another one, there's another one. So in this case here, there are four digits. This one is 52, this one is 10, this one is five, and this one is uh, 10 plus uh, eight. Uh, eight, okay, right. let me remove one of these there, that makes it more consistent. Okay, that's seven, okay? So uh, 10 plus seven is 17. Well, you might say though, wait, what about this? Isn't this 10 plus five? Well, no, because there's a rather biggish space between them, okay? So if this was all one digit, then these units would be closer to the tens, something like this, or something like this, all right? So there's a little bit of judgment involved and sometimes uh, errors are made because scribes get confused as to whether there's a space or not. Zeros did not have a separate symbol, so for a zero digit they would just leave a space in the appropriate position. But they still had this sense of uh, what's called a place value system where each one of these digits represents a, a successive power of 60. So this is really a floating point system, but it's actually a true floating point system in that the, the sexagesimal point, if we say that as corresponding with our decimal point, uh, is, is ambiguous. It's not clear where it is amongst all of these digits. So when we represent one of these digits in our notation, we put a lot of dots just to separate the digits. So you might ask, well, where is the, the real dot? And the answer is there is no real dot. There is no base sexagesimal point. That's a very interesting aspect of their system that differentiates their use from our use. And you have to keep that in mind. So for example, this number here could have been represented in a number of different ways. It could be, if we start, start here and say, well, that's the units. So 17 plus 5 sixties plus 10 60 squareds plus 52 60 cubes. That would be one interpretation. And then this number x would be in our system 11,268,317. However, maybe from some other application, the sexagesimal point that we might think of would be in some different place. So this same expression could also represent 52 times 60 plus 10. So this could be like the, the ones position. And then to the right of that would be necessarily then powers of 60 with negative exponents. Okay, so they're, they're really um, not just talking about integers here, they're also talking about what we would say, you know, our decimals with digits to the right of the decimal or section decimal point. So it's very sophisticated, right? So to continue on here, this could be five times 60 to the minus one plus 17 times 60 to the minus two. But they didn't have any notation about, you know, powers and such like this. Uh, this is just our way of, of representing it, in which case uh, then the, the interpretation would be, oh, this is 3,130.0880, and for us, um, we can't represent uh, this particular number in, as a finite decimal, so we would have to introduce a, um, an, a repeating decimal at some point. Did they deal with repeating decimals? That's a very interesting question, okay?
because that's how we think about fractions, typically, in a decimal Hindu-Arabic system. The answer is no, they did not. They restricted themselves to finite decimals. So their arithmetic was exact. However, they understood that sometimes, if you divide it by certain numbers, you're going to get answers which are not representable in this finite fashion. They certainly understood that. In particular, dividing by seven is such an example. So it's quite remarkable. Uh, when I was teaching history of math some decades ago, probably now, um, I told my class that you know the Hindu Arabic number system is, is perhaps you know the most important mathematical development of, of you know in mathematics because it's really the basis for our number system. And that this you know goes back to Indian mathematicians and then to further developments by Arab mathematicians. I was a little bit ignorant of the um, prior uh, rich arithmetic that the, the Babylonian period had, which was thousands of years before that, you know, literally almost 3,000 years before uh, the advent of the Hindu Arabic system. And we can see all the aspects of that pretty well here, okay, except for a special um, designated symbol for a zero. But apart from that, they had basically a decimal arithmetic which was quite viable and, and powerful. We know that in the Babylonian period there was a well-established sort of educational system where young people, males typically, uh, were enrolled in scribal school as, as teenagers and they would go through several years of training to become familiar with uh, arithmetic and, and other things. Now these scribal schools relied very heavily on tables and we have quite a lot of records of tables that they used. These tables include tables of squares. You know, one squared is one, two squared is four, three squared is nine, four squared is 16, etc. And they would just carry on like this. And there was also tables of square roots. Square root of one is one. Square root of four is two. Square root of nine is three. Square root of 16 is four, etc. They also had uh, tables of cube roots. Presumably they had tables of cubes too, but I'm not sure if, if we actually found such. Um, very importantly, they had a table of reciprocals, and I'm going to have to say more about that. That was their most important table, probably, the table of reciprocals, which effectively uh, tells you how to divide. Because as I've stressed to you many times, it's really division, which is sort of the critical, the difficult, the challenging operation in arithmetic. How do you deal with division effectively? Well, the Babylonians used reciprocal tables. And they also had other tables which are very interesting called multiplication tables, but I prefer uh, to call them multiplication division tables. So my colleague Daniel Mansfield and I have talked a lot about this. Yes, and we are both in agreement that the, the role of these tables is not solely for multiplication. So there was an aspect of these tables that was very important for division. So I think it's more accurate to call them multiplication division tables and I'll be telling you about them a little bit more. They also had tables of sort of assorted stuff uh, that has to do with sort of practical things uh, like numerical data having to do with standardized weights or, or, uh, or, or lengths or uh, you know volumes um, etc. So for them numbers were not perhaps such abstract things as they are to us. I think it's fair to say that their numbers were more associated with metrological quantities. That is, most numbers came with some units. Okay? We're talking about so many uh, units of length, or so many units of area, so many units of, of weight. And when you're taking that point of view, then there's always this question of, of conversion from one unit to another. So we might compare this to, to the physicist, the modern physicist, who wants to record units uh, to some measurement, right? The answer is not just 15, but it's 15 meters per second squared or, or, or something. There, there's some units associated with a number. The number itself as a measurement doesn't make sense until you've specified the units. And if you change the units, then you have to rescale the number. Okay, and that's maybe one reason why they were a little bit flexible as to where the decimal point is. Because if your units are, say, organized to reflect this multiplication by 60, 
then changing the units really amounts to sort of shifting the sexagesimal point around. Okay, so here is their sexagesimal reciprocal table, which is at the core of their arithmetic, and it's something that every scribe would have had to memorize. So they would have known this back and forwards. And sometimes it's associated with the terms Iggy, Iggy B, uh, you know, in terms of a number and it's, and it's reciprocal. So what we have here is say a number n and it's reciprocal. So let's denote the reciprocal is typical uh, with a bar, okay? So remember this is all in base 60 and we're, we're floating in, in terms of the powers of 60. So the number one and the number 60 are represented both by a, just a single vertical stroke as is the number 60 squared, what we would call 3,600, okay? So, what's the reciprocal of 2? What do you have to multiply 2 by to get 1? Well, 2 times 30 is 1, because 2 times 30 is 60, and you write down a 60, that's the same as 1. The reciprocal of 3 is 20, the reciprocal of 4 is 15, the reciprocal of 5 is 12, the reciprocal of 6 is 10, and so on. But the reciprocal of 8 is 7.30, okay? That's so what, like, we would say 7.5 but the half to them, because everything is written out as a decimal, is 7.30. 9 is 6.40. 10 is 6, 12 is 5, etc. Okay, and you see it gets a little bit complicated. And uh, note also that not every number has a reciprocal. That's really important to, to mention. So the first number that does not have a reciprocal is in here. We're missing 7. 7 does not have a, a reciprocal. Why? Because 7 is not regular. So the numbers which have finite, realizable reciprocals in their base 60 system are the regular numbers. And what does that mean? It means that they're numbers whose factors are consisting of twos, threes, and fives, because those are the factors of 60. So you cook up any number just by multiplying a certain number of twos, threes, and fives together. That's going to be regular in the sense that it's reciprocal in base 60 will be a finite decimal, which means they can write it down, they can be sure they know exactly what it is, okay? That is a, a division that can be done for them, okay? So for them, division by 6 and division by 7 were very different. You could divide by 6, could in the sense of being able to do it exactly, but you could not divide by 7 exactly. You could only divide by 7 approximately. Now, this is very interesting because it's a little bit far removed from our understanding. We think, well, you can divide by anything. Yeah, but what we have to do to try to make that work is to have a, an extended arithmetic so-called of, of uh, repeating decimals. And we'll talk uh, some future video about the challenges involved in getting that actually off the ground officially. Okay, anyway, so here's the reciprocal table, and you can see that there's some interesting uh, quantities. A uh, reciprocal of 27, that's a power of 3, right? So that has, that's regular, it has a reciprocal. It's 2.13.20, so it has actually three uh, sort of places, it's getting complicated. And uh, 81, which is down here, 1.21, is 44.26.40, it's, it's the most complicated one. So this is the reciprocal table. Uh, the reciprocal of 1 is 1. You might ask, isn't that sort of silly? Why do we need to, to mention that? The Babylonians were very systematic. They didn't leave out things. They wanted to list everything completely, clearly, exactly, without any omission, even if some entry is well known to everybody. Okay, now have a look that you'll see that some of these numbers are, um, are underlined in green. These numbers, the majority of them, okay, but not all of them, these numbers have a, a special role that they have associated multiplication slash division tables associated to them. We'll talk about that later, okay? But so this is a, an indication of the richness of sexagesimal arithmetic because if you made a corresponding uh, table uh, in the Hindu Arabic world, it would be much more limited. It would be much smaller and less useful than this one. So if you're going to do a lot of division, you probably prefer to be a Babylonian using their base 60 system, which is more powerful for doing division. Now the first thing that a primary school student would probably think when they hear that the ancient Babylonians used a base 60 system is, wait a minute, how are you going to do multiplication? 
It was bad enough having to memorize a 10 by 10 multiplication back in grade 3 or 4. But they had to memorize a 60 by 60 multiplication table, or maybe a 59 by 59 multiplication table. Surely that's impossible. So that's a, an interesting question. Is how do you actually do arithmetic? How do you multiply these digits? Because that's probably something that you need to do. Well, one aid that they had is these multiplication or multiplication slash division tables, which had listed multiples of a lot of numbers that you might want to take multiples of. So, for example, this is a, a 10 times table. This is how they would have represented the 10 times table. And this would have been a tool that would be sitting somewhere in the, the scribal classroom. Where's the 10 time table? Okay, I need it for a second. Okay. So, what's involved here? So, here's our symbol for 10. And here's some cuneiform expression that means, you know, multiply or, or times. So, 10 times 1, and here's the answer. Okay, 10 times 1 is 10. Now, the next row doesn't have the 10. We've already established what the 10 is. It just has times 2. Okay, times 2 is 20. There's 20. Times 3 is 30. And then it goes times 4, times 5, times 6, times 7, times 8, times 9, times 10, times 11, times 12, times 13, times 14, times 15, times 16, times 17, times 18, times 19, down to times 20. Now you think it's pedantic for me to say all of that. That would not have been considered pedantic for uh, an ancient Babylonian, right? That's what they wanted to do. They wanted to list them all. And so there would be a long list of all the multiples of 10 up to 20. And after that, it jumps. So the next one is by 30. So 10 times 30. What is 10 times 30? Well, for us, that would be uh, 300. And if you convert 300 to base 60, um, well, we have to use the 60s unit, so it's 5 60s. So the answer is 5. Because 5 times 60 is represented by 5. And the next one is 40 times 10. 10 times 40 is, we would say, 400. How do you represent that base 60? Well, that's 360 plus 40. 360 is like 6 60s. So there's a 6 and 40. And uh, the last one is 10 times 50, which you can check is 8, 20. There's 8, there's 20. All right, so these are, these are separate digits. That's, that's a digit, that's a digit, that's a digit, that's a digit. So this is uh, typical. Um, so they, for all of those underlined uh, things that are in green on the reciprocal table, and also for some, some other ones, they had such corresponding multiplication or multiplication slash division tables. So that's at least one way that they could have helped themselves doing multiplication. In fact, how they did their arithmetic is a, a hugely interesting and largely unknown uh, issue. Okay? A lot of people speculate because they do quite extensive calculations and sometimes like, you know, huge calculations where they have end up with, with numbers with, with like a, a dozen or more digits. And so how, how do they do this? Well, uh, there's a division of opinion, but I think most people are thinking that they probably had some kind of abacus or, or counting board, some kind of mechanical procedure that help them to do their arithmetic. Because we never see on these tablets, we never sort of see off in the margins, even on the many school texts that we have, you know, somebody actually doing a multiplication sort of longhand, like you might see in a modern uh, kid's notebook. Okay? So chances are the actual arithmetic was done on, on, think of an abacus, think of an abacus that has, you know, um, uh, ones and tens, you know, and then ones and tens, and then ones and tens, representing the digits of the, the sexagesimal number. So then they probably had some, some you know, technology for, for multiplying uh, at, at that level there. So that would have simplified um, the, the process for multiplication, although it still would have been, um, you know, non-trivial. But uh, crucially, we, we don't know for sure just physically how they actually did their, their arithmetic. This is a very interesting sort of conundrum. So I've told you about multiplication tables. So they had multiplication tables for two, for three, for five, four, etc. Uh, so they had all these multiplication tables. But 
Remarkably, they also had what are called combined multiplication tables, which we might call combined multiplication division tables. And that's a cumulative table that basically has all the multiple tables together, sort of one after the other. And so that those are very big tables, okay? And so the tablets are, are quite uh, impressive. And um, so these things typically contain multiples of all the green underlined numbers that I showed you on the reciprocal table, and typically a few more. So, for example, remember we said that uh, the reciprocal of uh, 8 was 7.30. On this combined table, they would also have multiples of 7.30. So all the multiples of 7.30 uh, from 1 to 20 and then 30, 40, 50. Okay? And you might ask why. And even more interestingly, they had, remember this number here, this was 1 over 81, 44.26.40. They had all multiples of that. 1 to 20, 30, 40, 50 as well. So we could well ask, why do they have? I mean, why do you want to multi find multiples of this? I wonder what 7 times 44.26.40 is. Let me look that up. Okay, well, the answer is because what they're really wanting to do is do, do some division. So 1 eighth, what we call 1 eighth, is 730. What we call 1 over 81 or 1 over 1.21, okay, is this uh, number here. So multiples of, say, 730 allow you to essentially divide by 8. If you know multiples of 730, what you really have is, is 1 over 8 and 2 over 8 and 3 over 8, all the way up to 20 over 8, and then also 30 over 8, 40 over 8, 50 over 8. So this is the, the real meaning of these things, and this is why they deserve to be called multiplication division tables, because they would have been used also for division. That's why these more obscure numbers are in these combined multiplication tables very prominently. Okay? So it's not just multiplication, they were interested in division and this was a, a powerful tool to allow them to divide when you could divide. Namely when you were dividing by a regular number like 8 or 81, but not 7, 11, 13. Etc. Okay, so you can't really appreciate uh, this old Babylonian mathematics until you've seen um, one of their problems. Okay, so they had tables, but they also had lots of problem texts, which were basically explanations of how you solve various problems. Sometimes the problems are indeed quite challenging, and they definitely show that their mathematical abilities were far more uh, sophisticated than we would have possibly even imagined 100 years ago or 150 years ago. So here is an example of a, of a transcription of a tablet. Okay. Um, I actually got this example from a lovely paper by Donald Knuth where he talks about algorithms and the algorithmic approach in uh, the uh, old Babylonian times. And it's quite interesting because he's a computer scientist and he's interested in the parallels between the way the Babylonians thought and you know, writing programs. They had a very systematic kind of approach. And we can sort of see that in action here by looking at a question like this. So uh, let me go through this and explain what's going on and uh, leave you to think about, you know, the actual manipulations. So it starts, a rectangular cistern. Okay, so you've got some hole in the ground or something which is rectangular. So it's like a, a box. Okay, think of a box. It's a rectangular box, it's like a kind of rectangular base and it's got some height. The height is 3.20 and a volume of 27.46.40 has been excavated. Okay, so that's the volume of this box. We're not told what the units are and we're not exactly told where, you know, the, the sexagesimal point is. Okay, the length exceeds the width by 50. So we're talking about the base. We know the height, and the length exceeds the width by 50. Okay, so what they, do they want? Well, at, at the end, you find the length and, and, and the width. So the aim is to find out what the length and the width of this box are. So the first thing we should do is we should um, find the, the area of this base rectangle, right? It's really a question about the area, about a rectangle. So to get the area, we should take the volume, and divide by the height. Okay, so we have to divide by the height. Okay, so 
How do you divide by 3.20? Well, you have to take its reciprocal. So the reciprocal, take the reciprocal of the height, 3.20, to get 18. So if you looked on our uh, reciprocal table, the reciprocal of 18 is 3.20. So dividing by 3.20 is the same as multiplying by 18. And so note also that the number that's being used here is for illustrative purposes. And it's arranged that this has a, a number that does actually have a nice reciprocal that you can look up on the reciprocal table. Okay, so we've got the re reciprocal of the height, which is 18. So now multiply this by the volume. Okay, there's the volume again, 27.46.40. So you have to multiply this by 18. Okay, so you have to do a multiplication. And what you get is 8.20. So you might think, well, what are the, where are the units here? Well, um, you know, let, let's say that you happen to think that the, the, the sexagesimal point is, is right here. So this is a volume of about 27, okay? So we're gonna have to multiply by 18. How should we think of that 18? We should think of that as like a point 18. So it's like 1860s, which is like roughly one, one fourth or something like this. Okay, so you're really taking one fourth of, of the 27 roughly and, 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 and getting uh, an eight. Okay, so that's, that's sort of one way of interpreting, you know, sort of taking, um, taking some position, but it's not the only uh, possible interpretation. You could put the sexagesimal place in other places and it would still sort of work. Okay, and now what we have? Now we have um, an unknown length and an unknown width. We have this rectangular, just base, okay? So we know what the area of the, the rectangle is. It's 8.20. And we also know the difference between the length and the width. Okay, so now what's going on here is ultimately a, a solution to a quadratic equation. So let me, let me go through what they do and I'll explain it in, uh, briefly uh, in the next slide. So take half of 50. Uh, where is 50? 50 is the difference between the length and the width. And square it, obtaining 10.25. Okay, so there's some rule here that's being used that they, that they know. And so they're demonstrating this rule. You take half of this number here, you square it, you get that. Okay, you add 820. That's that number there. You add 820 and you get 8.30.25. Now notice at this point here, at this point when you're adding this to, to this, you have to have a sense of the relative sexagesimal places, okay? So uh, what's adding here, this, this 8 corresponds to, uh, or maybe I should say the 20 here uh, corresponds to this 10, okay? So if, if there's a decimal point or a sexagesimal point here, then there would be a sexagesimal point out front there to get 8.30.25. The square root is 2.55. We have to take the square root of this thing. Now, crucially, this is a number which is an exact square. Okay? They appreciated that you couldn't take a square root unless you have a number which is a complete square. So they would have arranged this beforehand so that this thing is actually a complete square. Of course, the way they would have arranged this is the same way a modern high school teacher would is to start with the, the, the box, the box is this by this by this, and then cook up these various things so that you know that then the solution is going to end up with the, the numbers that you, you ascribed to the dimensions in the first place. Okay? That's going to ensure that this actually sort of works out. But it's important to realize they couldn't just take arbitrary square roots. Okay? So when they say take the square root, it means look something up on a table and, and find the, the square root is this. They actually had some more sophisticated algorithms for doing that. Okay, make two copies, adding 25 to one, subtract 25 from uh, the other. Okay, this 25, um, that's uh, this half of 50, okay? So we sort of ha having to uh, add and, and, and subtract this half of 50, and you find the length is 320 and the width is 230. So from this thing here, if you add 25, okay, where are you gonna add it? Well, uh, think of the decimal point as being uh, right here, okay? So if you add that, you're going to get 2 point, like uh, 2.80, and the eight, one of the 80s comes out to give us 3.20. And if you subtract the 0.25 from this, then you're going to get 2.30. Okay? And then there's one more line, which I abbreviate by T-I-T-P, and that's the line 
this is the procedure. Okay? So the, the solution is aiming to show you the steps that you should take in order to solve this kind of problem. And it does so not by using sort of X's and Y's as we might, but by actually using specific numbers, okay, which are carefully chosen so that things work out and so that someone can follow the argument with the explicit examples that are, that are being used. It's not a bad way of explaining stuff, is it? Okay, so what's going on with the last few lines of that, uh, of that solution? Well, that was their approach to the quadratic formula. So the essential problem that we're trying to solve is we have some rectangle with some dimensions x and y, and we know that the difference between those two things is say some number d, okay, d for difference, and the product, the area is x times y, say that's p. Okay, and so from this data we're trying to determine x and y. Now you may have done this a long time ago and perhaps you've forgotten, but this is a quadratic equation, okay? And so to convert this into a quadratic equation, what you do is you use one of these equations, let's say this one here, to solve for y. You replace, you think of y as being p over x, okay? And then you replace this y with that p over x. So to get an equation just involving x. So you get x minus p over x equals d. And then you clear denominators, so you get x squared minus p equals d times x. You can bring everything to one side, you get x squared minus dx minus p equals zero. So now it's what we recognize as a familiar quadratic equation. We're looking for x. And after we found x, we can then solve for y. So the quadratic equation that you learned in school at some point, which you may have forgotten, is um, the equation that this x is uh, minus the coefficient here, so the d, plus or minus is a square root of this coefficient squared, so minus d squared, same as d squared, okay, and then minus 4ac, so minus 4 times the coefficient here, which is 1, times this minus p, so that's all together, plus 4p, and you have to divide all that by 2 times the coefficient here, which is just 2. So this is our uh, way of saying this, so there's two solutions for x. So. The, the Babylonian um, solution that you see on that tablet is a, a variant of this. It's sort of, sort of rewritten a little bit. Um, so it basically amounts to the, that, the, the x and the y together. The two things that you're interested in here can be found by taking the square root of d over 2 squared plus p and either adding or subtracting d over 2. Okay, so this thing is pretty well the same as this, except that we're sort of dividing by two and, and uh, um, just sort of putting a, a factor of, of, pulling a factor of two out, out here, let's say, okay? Um, and then, so that two will cancel with that two and, and, and this becomes this. But interestingly, it's giving you the solution of x and y together, okay? So to get x and to get y basically at the same time, you add uh, d over 2 to this quantity and you subtract d over 2 to this quantity and you get the, the length and the width at the same time. So, you know, arguably for this kind of question, this is actually arguably sort of a superior um, procedure than this one because even if you do this, then you've got x, but you still have to calculate y from a, a separately. Okay, anyway, so uh, this is totally remarkable because, you know, people thought that quadratic equations uh, were first studied uh, and solved by Arabic mathematicians or Islamic mathematicians. And, uh, you know, that was the story for a long time until we realized, started digging in southern Iraq and realized, well, hey, wait a minute, uh, these people who lived 3,000 years before that um, not only knew the quadratic equation, but they knew it very well, okay? There's, there's lots of examples of them routinely solving quadratic equations. So it's a very remarkable story and it's a, a very remarkable arithmetic and Interestingly, this arithmetic has really stood the test of time. More than a thousand years later, when the ancient Greeks got around to doing, you know, astronomy, Ptolemy, uh, when they were writing, uh, making calculations, they didn't use the Greek numerical system because it wasn't powerful enough. Okay, the Greek numerical system was not powerful enough. They used the Babylonian system to make their calculations. When Al-Kashi, a great Islamic uh, mathematician, in the 14th century was uh, working in, in, in Samarkand on, 
at a, an astronomy and was computing pi. To, he had the record for the greatest number, of, the greatest accuracy of computing pi to some 15 or 16 sexagesimal digits. Okay, so he computed it in, in sexagesimal. And in fact, I had the, uh, the pleasure of being in Uzbekistan a few years ago and, and I gave a talk there on rational trigonometry and one of the uh, members of um, the audience came up to me afterwards and showed me this wonderful book that they had uh, which was some compilation of some earlier uh, trig tables that had been uh, written you know, in, in back in, in, in those days, uh, the Islamic period, maybe 1500 or something. But you know, hundreds of pages of, of tables and it was all in, in, um, in base 60. So you know, it's, it's powerful. Um, this is a really interesting that such uh, an early civilization, essentially really the first it's really the first developed uh, arithmetic, you know, in history, also happened to be at such an incredibly high level. It, it almost boggles the mind. I'm Norman Lobberger. Thanks for listening.